Pucks with Hags is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Welcome to another edition of the Pucks with Hags podcast. As always, I am your host, Joe Haggerty. You can find my work at joehaggerty.substack.com. Uh, apply for a premium subscription. You get all of my NHL and Bruins writing sent straight directly to your inbox. I also file columns after every single Bruins game for the Boston Sports Journal, so check that out at bostonsportsjournal.com. Greg Bedard, Mike Giardi, a host of talented writers covering all the major sports here in Boston. Uh, Pucks with Ags is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports sports platform in North America and the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Instead of battling thousands of other players that could be pros or sharks, you simply pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll right in. For example, past David Pasternak, you can pick shots on net. Charlie McAvoy, you could pick hits. Uh, you could pick Jason Tatum points, rebounds for the Celtics. You could pick um, anybody on the Red Sox. Uh, I don't know if they're actually going to come through for you, but you might want to pick losses uh, for the Red Sox as a team. I know you can't do that stat projection. So um, you would have to pick, I guess, Byron Bello, Brian Bello. Is that his name? Uh, strikeouts, walks, something like that. Um any of that stuff, though, you pick more or less for uh, statistical categories. It's fun and pretty simple. Download the Prize Picks app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's download the Prize Picks app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Uh, I would pick less for every single Red Sox player. That's basically what I'm trying to tell you. All right, um, let's move on to the podcast. I believe this is the 77th episode of the Pucks with Hags podcast, the Ray Bork episode of the Pucks with Hags podcast. Um, I will be answering some of your questions. This will be a mailbag edition uh, for the most part. Uh, three to two shutout win for the Bruins over the Capitals on Saturday night. Uh, solid uh, shootout win. Uh, Bruins did a really good job of killing off a Hampus Lindholm double minor high sticking penalty in overtime. Basically the entirety of overtime, they were shorthanded. Um, they managed to kill off that penalty. Jeremy Swain made a bunch of saves. Um, they got goals from Lindholm actually uh, during the game and Johnny Beecher uh, had a nice play unassisted. Um, nice five hole goal after speeding past everybody and scoring, uh, showing his value and, and, you know, we'll get into this, but I, I, one of the things I really liked about that game against the Capitals was some of the guys that are scratching and clawing and fighting for fourth line jobs right now showed up, uh, whether it was Beecher scoring that hustle goal, whether it was Jacob Lauko, um had, I think, three hits, four block shots and like eight plus minutes of ice time, uh, less than 10 minutes of ice time. He was in James, James Van Riemsdyk was out. Van Riemsdyk didn't do much of anything uh, in the game that he had played before that. And it's starting to feel like, uh, at least to start the playoffs, JVR might be one of the players on the outside looking in because maybe he's a little banged up. Maybe he's slowed down a little bit. Certainly, uh, I think he's less effective in a bottom six role than some of these other guys that can bring energy, physicality, all kinds of different things. Guys like Lauko, Beecher, uh, Jesper Boquist. Um, certainly, Justin Brazo, I think, is starting to show that he deserves to be in the lineup uh, as well. Um, so I think that's something that's really interesting to watch is just this developing competition uh, for the fourth line, certainly in, in parts of the third line as well, where it looks like um, maybe Danton Heinen has locked in a top six uh, winger job right now with the way that he's played uh, down the stretch. And so that pushes everybody down into these third and fourth line competitions um, you know, skating with guys uh, like Trent Frederick, uh, who is obviously a lock uh, to be on that third line, uh, and Morgan Geeky um, as well, uh, looking like he's locking down that center position on the third line. So um, that stuff's going to be interesting to watch. The biggest thing that I found from that three to two win over the Capitals, though, aside from just getting the win, good win against a team that's hungry in Washington, that's clawing for points that, you know, you had to match their intensity and their their willingness to to win and to make plays in order to get the result um uh, Hampus Lindholm I thought was one of his best games uh yes he did have the high sticking penalty in overtime he's had for my money way too many high sticking penalties this year uh, but had over 26 minutes of ice time had uh the first goal of the game where he just 
uh, threw a shot on net from the point, a wrist shot through a flash screen. And I think it was Marshan in front of, uh, in front of Lindgren, the goalie for the Capitals, uh, ends up going through, uh, and, and, you know, nobody stops it, nobody blocks it and ends up going in the back of the net, kind of an unlikely goal, but it, it went in because Hampus Lindholm put a shot on net, uh, something that James, uh, Jim Montgomery has been preaching, uh, to his players. Uh, so he gets a second goal of the, the, um, season, uh, played over 26 minutes, blocked a few shots, great defensive game goal saving play in uh, the opening minutes of the game when uh, Alex Ovechkin got a shot on net Jeremy Swayman kicked out a rebound couldn't control the puck when the rebound popped out got kind of out of position as he was scrambling uh, Connor McMichael looked like he was going to have an open net to shoot at with Swayman sort of out of position all of a sudden uh, Lindholm comes out of nowhere gets his stick along the goal line and deflects the puck from going in saves a goal um really allowed i think along with swayman playing really well in those first few minutes the bruins to get their footing when they didn't start very well in that game um and keep the capitals off the board and then eventually lindholm uh you know scores the goal to get the momentum back and the bruins were kind of off and running in a competitive game after that but massive play early in that game from hampus lindholm massive defensive play that uh, impacted the game and he goes out and scores the goal too uh, that was also impactful. And uh, I thought just played a pretty solid defensive game. Um, perhaps no coincidence that he had a very good game uh, skating in a pairing with Charlie McAvoy, something the Bruins wanted to look at here down the stretch, just uh, with matchups, with stuff they might want to do in the playoffs. And for me, when I see uh, Charlie McAvoy and I see him, it's Lindholm playing together in a pairing down the stretch right before the playoffs it reminds me a little bit of 2011 with uh, Dennis Seidenberg put with Zdeno Chara, where why not put your two best defensemen, two guys that can play close to 30 minutes a night, uh, two guys that two big time defensemen, shutdown defensemen that are in the prime of their careers and can play in all situations. Why not put them together in the playoffs where they can shut down the other team's best line, where they can play about 30 minutes a night and really cut the game in half. You can have those two out there kind of locking things down for half of the game you know, a lot of special team situations and also plenty of five on five when the other team's best players are out there. And then you can kind of piece together with Brandon Carlo, with Matt Grizzlick, with uh, Parker Weatherspoon, um, with Kevin Shattenkirk, if he's out there, um, with Andrew Peake, who I think has been excellent too, uh, by the way, uh, played over 21 minutes in that game, blocked a bunch of shots, had had some hits and, and looked really strong again uh, in that game and is really in, in a hunt for the playoffs and will be in the playoffs for the first time in his NHL career after kind of languishing in Columbus uh, before getting traded to the Bruins at the deadline. So uh, why not put McAvoy and Lindholm together, or at least think about putting them together uh, as this monster pairing at the top uh, of the defense uh, that can, you can throw out there for half the game and then figure out the rest with the other four defensemen um, as you go, uh, as you go through. Uh, I think that's something they should look at. I'm glad they put him in a pairing last night. I'm glad the Bruins won and both defensemen played well. Maybe it's something they'll go back to, but I, I certainly uh, liked that move by Montgomery. I liked giving that pairing a look, and I like the idea of putting them together in the playoffs against another team's best line, especially if it's sort of a big heavy line to shut them down. So um, I thought that was an excellent move, uh, and I w- it was really encouraging to see Lindholm respond the way he did in the play game the way he, the way he did because, like, I – you know, I was writing about it earlier. Um, he's got two goals, what, 28 points, something like that this year. Um, you know, he's a plus player, like plus 15, whatever. Uh, but he had, uh, I think it was 10 goals over 50 points last year, was like around a plus 30, I think, maybe more than that. Um, and it just, it makes you realize how much of a down year he had offensive production-wise and how different a year this was for him. Uh, And I think the changing of the personnel, um, not being as dominant offensively, not playing puck possession in the offensive zone as much as they did the year before, you know, not having the juggernaut offensive team, I think it might have affected Hampus Lindholm more than anybody else on this team as far as what he could bring and how he had to play. 
I think he could be afford to be much less uh, of a guy taking risks offensively, much less of a guy really playing up and being aggressive uh, in a lot of those situations because they just didn't have the puck in the offensive zone long enough, didn't have possession long enough for him to kind of set up or to take risks or to do different things uh, uh, on the ice that he was doing the year before to create. Uh, and it really changed things. Like, I just don't think he wasn't as good a player this year as he was last year. That's part of it. But I think it also has a lot to do with the personnel changes for the Bruins uh, and how different they are this year, that it affected him and his production maybe more than anybody else. You know, yeah, David Pasternak went from 60 goals last year. He's probably going to be around 50 this year. You know, dropping 10 goals is pretty significant. That's a significant drop off in goal production. Uh, but he's also upped his assists, upped his playmaking, setting career highs and assists and uh, you know, we'll still be way up uh, in the points category uh, certainly up over a hundred and, and close to what he did last year, but uh, also interesting to see his goals are down a little bit, but the point production is not nearly as off a cliff as it is for Hampus Lindholm. So uh, maybe that will get him going a little bit offensively as well, playing with Charlie McAvoy uh, in a situation where he's out there with usually the best players against the other team's best players. And maybe they can attack them uh, defensively as well. Um so maybe this will be a good thing for him to finally unlock a little bit of what he has to give in the playoffs and to offer because uh, we are now going 11 straight games over the last two seasons with Lindholm in the playoffs for the Bruins, zero points, zero impact in the game positively really. Uh, got hurt in two years ago in Carolina after taking a big hit and and was never the same in that series to uh, this past series, uh, playoff series last year, going against Florida, really being suffocated by that Florida forecheck, no points, no real impact on that series in a positive way, and really struggled uh, against the Florida forecheck. So maybe that can be different this time around if you put him with Charlie McAvoy. All right, um, let's also give credit uh, quickly. Jeremy Swayman played really well in that game last night. He's been sort of up and down at times. Um, but he's played, and this means something to me, he's played really well in the important games, and he's been given a lot of the important games down the stretch. And that tells me, I think, uh, how the Bruins are planning to use him, think they're still going to use him. He played in both games against Toronto, won those. He played against the Florida Panthers, won that game. He played against the Washington Capitals, another uh, team that will be a playoff team and has played really well down the stretch, won that game in the shootout. Um when he's had to and when the competition has been there and when the team has played well in front of him, he's won and he's looked just as good as he did in the first half, even if the post all-star break numbers haven't been as good for him. I'm not one of these people that that really thinks that um, we need to stir it up and create a goalie controversy about who's going to start game one. I still think it's going to be Swayman based on the way they've used him. Uh, and the games that they've put him in, the situations they continue to put him, they're playing him like the number one, putting him against all the tough opponents and, and all the big matchups. And he's coming out with wins in all those games. So uh, I think that's meaningful. And I think the Bruins are paying attention to that. The Pucks with Hags podcast is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up, whether it's the tournament season or the fight for playoff home court. It goes beyond the hockey that we're talking about. We're talking about basketball as well. There's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app where you can turn your hoops knowledge into some serious cash. And what better way to also uh, pick players and go more or less than with uh, the some of the celebrity uh, prize picks favorite players like Meek Mill and Sugar Sean O'Malley. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. The app is easy to download, so download that prize picks app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's downloading the prize pick app and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Um, with the last win over the Washington Capitals, Bruins also over 100 points for the sixth straight season, not including 2021 when COVID cut the season short. And I think they only end up with like 73 points. They played 50 something games. Uh, so you kind of throw that season out. Um, they would have been over 100 points that year as well, obviously, with 30 games to go in, uh, in the 70s. Um, but uh, over 100 points, six straight seasons, would be seven straight seasons under Don Sweeney. Um, 
I think that's notable. I think that's something you need to recognize uh, that there's been regular season excellence uh, that they've been doing it year in and year out, no matter who's leaving. You know, you've had some great players, Hall of Fame players leave over the last handful of years, whether it was Dan Ochara, you know, a few years ago now, whether it was Bergeron and Krejci this summer, um, you know, you've, you've seen excellent players, impact players, Tori Krug left uh, not too long ago, um, leave the Bruins fold and either go somewhere else or retire. And the Bruins just continue. The beat goes on with them. The culture lives on. And I think that's a credit to the players. that are still in that room. It's a credit to the management. It's a credit to the organization that they continue to, uh, find players to bring in that will perform, find players that will replace or have players step up that will replace the players that left, i.e. Uh, Charlie Coyle stepping up and really, you know, doing uh, a lot of the things that Patrice Bergeron did before and playing that way and and really playing well. I know he struggled a little bit as of late, and maybe the usage that he had all year is kind of wearing him down a little bit, but I got to tell you, like, he's had a great year. Um, and you would hope and expect that he would be able to get up to that level uh, once the playoffs start, um, even if, you know, he's kind of conserving here down the stretch. Um, but, you know, he's had an excellent year, and they wouldn't be in the spot that they were in if he didn't step up performance-wise, step up leadership-wise, step up really in every way. Um, so that's a real credit to him. Uh, and, and what he's been able to do. But, you, you know, the Bruins would not be able to continue to churn out 100-point seasons and be among the best in the NHL if they didn't have guys like Charlie McAvoy that stepped up when the, the time was right and when the call came. Uh, so credit to them, credit to him, and, uh, you know, just job well done, not only being over 100 points, but also being the second team to clinch the playoffs behind just the New York Rangers. doesn't mean anything about what they're going to do in the playoffs, but I think you should tip your cap and at least recognize – uh, regular season accomplishments while the regular season is going on. We'll have plenty of time to dissect the playoffs and to focus on that once it gets here in a couple of weeks. All right, let's answer some questions. Um, hi, Joe. I have some comparisons. I see some comparisons between the comparisons between this year's overachieving Bruins and the Stanley cup winning team in 2011. If you have time on an upcoming podcast, could you do a quick comparison of the 2011 Bruins lineup Versus this year's team. If this team gets stellar goaltending at the playoffs like that team did, we could easily win a few rounds. Thank you. Love the podcast. Roger Perry via the Facebook fan page. Thanks, Roger. Glad you like the podcast. This is a really good question. Um, I don't see the parallels uh, between this team and uh, the 2011 team. I got to be honest with you. Um, the goaltending... I would say, yes, that year they had Tuka Rask and Tim Thomas, and Tim Thomas was out of his mind excellent that year. I don't think they've had either, you know, Swayman's been an all-star this year, there's no question about it, but I don't think we're talking about Jeremy Swayman uh, as a Vesna Trophy winner like we did that year with Tim Thomas. Tim Thomas had one of the best years during the regular season and during the playoffs of any goalie in NHL history. Um so I wouldn't put Jeremy Swayman's performance this year or even their combined performance into that uh, category or even close to that category. Uh, not to mention, I think Tim Thomas had a little bit better of a, tra a playoff track record by that point. I mean, it, he greatly, uh, vastly improved it with what he did those playoffs, winning the Conn Smythe and shutting out the Tampa Bay Lightning in Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals, shutting out the Vancouver Canucks in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. Uh, the numbers that he put up were, you know, among the best ever uh, in, in a playoff. Uh, you know, some massive save games, uh, some huge saves along the way in those series. Um, so I, I put it this way. I think the only way this Bruins team this year, this edition of the Boston Bruins, who have been a very good team, one of the best in the Eastern Conference, certainly a playoff team and better than we thought they were going to be, because I think a lot of people, myself included, thought they were going to be a wild card team. But I think the only way this team is going to win multiple rounds, go on a deep run in the playoffs this spring, and really maybe surprise us with what they do in the postseason, and I hope they do because there's nothing better than uh, playoff hockey atmosphere in Boston. So I hope they go on a two-month uh, sojourn through the Stanley Cup playoffs and, and go all the way to the end just because it will be great entertainment and it will be good for the fans. But – 
The only way I think that's going to happen is if their goaltending gets super hot. If one of those two goalies goes on a run, gets hot, stays hot, and steals a series or two, steals a bunch of playoff games, whether it's Jeremy Swayman or Allmark. And I think Swayman's got more of a chance to do it just because I think he's at a point where he could still prove that to be that guy and could show if he plays, you know, lights out in the playoffs that he he should and could be that guy. I think Linus Elmark has had a multiple chances to do that now and has shown that he wears down when he's playing game in and game out in the playoffs and starts to, I think, show signs of fatigue. I think starts to do uh, out-of-character things in the net, gets too hyperactive, loses some of his technique, uh, certainly takes risks and does things and makes mistakes that he doesn't need to that lead to like easy goals that the other teams score. There were two or three games uh, in that Florida series last year where Omar did things that led to very easy goals for Florida that were based on what Omar did, the mistake he made, the risk he took, whatever he did. Um, that's very unlike him because usually he's quiet, smart, economical, doesn't, you know, make a lot of mistakes that are going to give easy chances to the other team, uh, is just a sound, calm goalie. And I just didn't think he played calm at all in the playoffs. Maybe that was partially Matthew Kachuk getting in his head. Maybe that was him getting uh, worn down physically and mentally from the strain of, of the playoffs. Whatever it was, I still maintain, and I've said this since last spring, that Jeremy Swayman should have started game five of that first round series against the uh, Florida Panthers when things really like uh, reverse the other way. That's really when the series turned when they were not able to win game five uh, at home up in the series. um, And that's where they got into trouble. Um, And, you know, that was the game Patrice Bergeron came back. That was the game uh, Brad Marchand couldn't finish off uh, a breakaway at the very end uh, that could have clinched the series. And uh, like, let's be honest. Drew Spurgeon was banged up. His back was hurt. They were not going to win the cup last year. I don't think anyway. I think they were probably going to lose in the second round, regardless of what happened against the Panthers, just because they were a banged up unit. A lot of guys were hurt. Um, But I think the easy second guess, an easy thing that they should have done differently was to rest Linus Allmark in game five, put Swayman in, put him in a less pressure situation than throw him into game seven of that series, which was a really tough spot to put him in. But uh, all that being said, I, I think you're on to something with the goaltending because I think that's the only way, um, Roger, that the Bruins are going to win um, a multiple playoff rounds this spring and potentially go on a deep run that could get them to the conference final, Stanley Cup final, whatever. Um, I don't think they are – I think they are capable of winning a first-round series based on their talent, based on the you know the level of play that they've been at. Uh, based on the matchup, some of the teams they might play, whether it's the Capitals, the Islanders, the the Leafs, the Red Wings. Um, certainly, I think the Lightning would give them problems if that ends up being their first round opponent. I I wouldn't favor them uh, in, a, in a, that kind of a series. I think they would have trouble with them. Uh, but but I think there's some very winnable opponents in that first round for the Boston Bruins. The problem becomes as you advance deeper into the playoffs. Uh, better teams that you're playing, more apt and able to expose your weaknesses. I think there are some weaknesses on this Bruins team and on this roster this year. I don't think it's anywhere close to his, uh, you know, a juggernaut with few weaknesses like last year's uh, roster was going into the postseason and going into the playoffs. They just couldn't address every issue they had in the roster at the trade deadline based on their salary cap situation and based on the lack of assets that they had to trade. So they added, you know, Pat Maroon and Andrew Peake. They had some toughness, some physicality, some heaviness, which they definitely needed. But they, they could have had more. Uh, they certainly could have used a center uh, that could win faceoffs, even though Johnny Beecher's done a serviceable job there. Um, they, I think, could have used another top six winger so they don't have to put Danton Heinen in that position. I think he'd be much better off as a third line winger uh, on this team and, and have somebody else that would be a legit goal scoring top six kind of winger to put with some of the other skill players, but they're, they're doing the best they can. They, this Bruins team has got, I think five guys that are under 800,000 a year contract wise uh, for the season, basically on the veteran minimum. Uh, that's, that's amazing that they were able, they they've operated with that many guys uh, making basically the veteran minimum on that NHL roster and still gotten a hundred points this year and been one of the best teams. I think that speaks to how good their good play, their best players have been, but also like uh, them scouting the right players, getting good fits, getting uh, great seasons out of a lot of guys that, you know, um, 
had to sign very modest contracts to, uh, to play on this Bruins team. Um, and, and, you know, really helped them get through a season where the salary cap was going to be an issue. And I think they've navigated that actually very well, uh, given all the challenges that, that they had. And you can sit here and say, yeah, that's Don Sweeney's, um, you know, fault, whatever, uh, the salary cap troubles, the cap penalties they had to pay for Bergeron and Krejci's contracts last year. Of course, uh, the buck always stops with the GM, but like, I didn't hear many people complaining last year when the Bruins went for it, when they signed the Bergeron and Krejci to incentive laden deals for one more, you know, that last dance, um, when they, they maxed out with, uh, all the trades that they made, bringing in Dimitri Orlov, Garnett Hathaway, Tyler Bertuzzi, like, uh, keeping all the players that they did, um, for that team last year, there were no complaints at the time. That's what they wanted to do. That's what they had to do. They knew it was Bergeron's last year and they were trying to win it with him there. Uh, and they didn't, they disappointed and they went out in the first round, but I, I, I'm not going to fault them ever for going for it. And then having to say, the, pay the salary cap Piper um, this year uh, after going for it last year. I think that's just part of competing and going for it is the price you pay. Uh, but getting back uh, Roger to your question about the 2011 team, the one thing I would say that's very different. Uh, well, first of all, center play, right? Um, you had Bergeron and Krejci in their prime, in 2011 as your top two centers, um, you know, Pavel Zaka and Charlie Coyle are excellent. They've been done very well this year. They I think they've gotten the most out of their abilities. They're both going to end up with 20 goal seasons. They have both been pretty productive. I, and I think they've done the best they can, but they are by no means the same kind of presence presences that Bergeron and Krejci were as top six centers on that team. So, you know, they don't really have the makeup, I think, as far as that goes, uh, built around the, their top two centers. Uh, you know, basically the whole team was built around that and their number one D in Zidane Ochara. Uh, they don't have a stopper like Zidane Ochara uh, on the back end. You know, you didn't see them blowing third period leads and you didn't see them going overtime all the time because they couldn't close out teams late in the third period when Zidane Ochara and Patrice Bergeron were on the ice at the end of those games. They just that just didn't happen. You didn't have these um, all crazy goals that are being scored uh, late in games against the Bruins that I think is going to come back to hurt them in the playoffs when those two were around. I and mean, we're talking about Hall of Fame defensive players and two way players here. So that's no shame on the guys now when comparing them to guys like Char and Bergeron. But those players were there and they're not those kind of players are not really here now on this team. Uh, so that's a way that I think they're different. And the other part is just the toughness element. Uh, the fourth line back then was was uh, Gregory Campbell, Sean Thornton, Daniel Paye. Thornton and Campbell were both, you know, were willing and combatants at all times. Uh, it was a veteran fourth line uh, that really played well together and had a veteran presence to them. Uh, the guys that they have now are not like that. You know, Jesper Boquist, Johnny Beecher, Jacob Lauko. Um, you know, Pat Maroon is more in that vein when he comes back and, and plays and will maybe bring a little bit of that Merlot sort of feeling uh, to the fourth line when he jumps on there. But, um, you know, or Justin Brazil when he's been on there, they've had a lot of young guys on minimum contracts playing on that fourth line, which is very different from the fourth line that they had before. And just in general, that team was and it was a different era, obviously. Uh, but that team had a lot of guys that could drop the gloves and fight on those teams. And they were very intimidating. They were very physical. They beat the living tar out of the Canucks and bullied the Canucks in that Stanley Cup series. So entertaining, so fun to watch. People still rave about the entertainment value and the level of entertainment of that Stanley Cup final. One of the best ever based on the two teams hating each other and the style of play and the way it went down and all that. But... um they don't have that kind of team now. They don't play that way. They play more like the Canucks did, to be honest with you, um, in 2011. And we saw that in 2019 when they played against the Blues. They, the Blues were more of the bullying, physical, heavy team, and they were pushing around the Bruins. And, and the Bruins have to sort of be very vigilant to not let themselves get pushed around because I think sometimes they, you know, they tend to default to that um that happening when they play physical teams and it, so it was good to see them stand up up to florida the last time they played them when florida was trying to push them around trying to bully them hampus lindholm gets his first nhl fight when sam bennett's all over him like to see those kind of things is good but it also sort of for me magnifies how different this team is than they were in 2011 too as far as the toughness goes as far as the so many guys that could fight on that team in 2011 and did instill fear in opponents. Um, and, and were just, you know, a different sort of feeling when they went on the ice together. So 
I don't see a comparison, to be honest with you. Uh, I think it's interesting that you did. I'm glad that you asked the question, but I just don't see that comparison between 2011 and this team now. Not only because Brad Marchand's the only holder over from that team that's on this team, but just because I just don't think they play the same way. I don't think it's the same kind of makeup of team. Uh, the only area where I would say, and you mentioned it, is you know maybe the goaltending could provide that level of goaltending uh, to help them win. And, and it would have to, they, their goaltenders are going to have to be out of their minds. Lena Salmark and Jeremy Swayman are going to have to be um, hot and, and playing at an elite level right out of the gate. If the Bruins are going to, you know, roll for two months and win the cup. And uh, you know, that's something that in uh, the Bruins would not have won in 2011. If Tim Thomas wasn't, you know, the best goalie in the world and having one of the best goalie seasons of all time in the NHL. So that part of it, I'm with you. Um, Roger, but I love the question. I think it was a great one. Thanks. Uh, feel free to send us questions anytime. Glad, glad you like the podcast, and uh, we'll keep on cranking them out for you. All right. Hi, Joe. I am sorry to hear about uh, Derek Forward's dog, Darla. Uh, Derek Forward's dog, Darla, passed away last week. Very sad. Um, thoughts are with uh, Derek and uh, the uh, people, his friends, that he had taking care of Darla when he was on the road. Uh, I am a dog lover and can relate with having to let them go to doggy heaven. Uh, that's ag at Magnus Shelty on uh, Twitter. Me too. Um, I am a firm believer and I've heard this, uh, you know, it's a cliche, but it's true. Um, the only bad day in a dog owner's life will be the the last day that the dog is alive, you know, and when uh, the dog passes away, it has to be put to sleep, like whatever the situation is. Um, it's, it's sad and there's no question about it. And that's why your heart goes out to somebody like Derek Forbort in a situation like this, especially when it's been an older dog that you've had for a long time. Um, it is really tough and it's just like losing a person, you know, and it's, uh, I have young kids and I have older dogs right now and, you know, they've had some health issues and there's been times when, you know, you weren't sure if they were going to get pulled through or not. And this is the first time the kids have really had to sort of deal with that situation and to see it through their eyes to see how upset they get, uh, it reminds you just how much it shatters you uh, when you lose your dog. So uh, thoughts go out to Derek Forboard. I hope you're doing okay with uh, Darla's passing and uh, you're not missing her too much. I'm sure you're missing her a ton, though. And, uh, you know, I'm sure when the time is right, you'll end up uh, finding another dog to take care of. Maybe won't be as beloved as Darla, but uh, that time will come, I'm sure. So uh, my thoughts are with you, Derek Forbert, on the, the passing of Darla. And I know Bruins uh, Nation is very sad about it as well. I'm sure they've sent you plenty of uh, messages to make you feel good because a lot of people, I think, got a lot of enjoyment out of your stories, your pictures, uh, everything you had with your dog, uh, the relationship you had with your dog. I think it hit home with uh, a lot of people. So, all right, uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, Joe, do you really think – the way they've constructed, uh, the way they're constructed, they can hang in a seven game series with a heavy team. That's from uh, SME. Great. Uh, do I think they can hang with a heavy team? Yes, I do think they can hang with a heavy team. Do I think they can beat a heavy team in a seven game series? I don't know. I'm not sure about that. I still do not think after watching those Florida games that if they are matched up with uh, them for a seven game series that. Um, that it's going to go any different than it did. I, I just think when you see them against the Florida Panthers, who are a fast, tough, physical, just dedicated team uh, that knows who they are, knows how they want to play, is going to punch you in the face and keep punching you and try to wear you down over a playoff series, um, where the Bruins are reactive to them. It's like the Bruins wait for Florida to do, do something to them, and then they react to it. And, and there are, you know... There are times when that doesn't, there are outliers and there are examples of that not happening. Like Charlie McAvoy, I think he will play physical and he was throwing big hits in that game against Florida. I think he was initiating. I think he was leading the way of the way the Bruins need to play. I just think more people need to follow Charlie McAvoy's lead and he can't be the one that's constantly doing it. And Marshan too, same thing. Um, you know, he dropped the gloves and fought a six foot four guy in that game as well. Um, those can't always be the guys. It's got to be other people stepping up and, and fighting back or really setting the tone physically or, or going at the, the Florida Panthers. And before they can get a chance uh, to go at you and get you to retaliate and, and take a stupid penalty, a careless penalty. Um, so 
I, when you're playing against a heavy team and you were not the heavy team in the playoffs, I think you're always at a disadvantage because I think over a seven game series, that heaviness, that physicality is going to wear you down. Uh, it's going to make your defensemen start to hear footsteps. It's going to get you uh, to start losing battles in front of your own net. It's going to knock players out of the series. It's going to make guys tentative, um, you know, going in full bore for pucks. Uh, I think all that stuff will happen over the course of a series uh, if you let it. Uh, and, you know, that's part of the beauty of the playoffs is it comes down to will just as much as it does skill and, and ability. It comes down to the will to win, uh, the will to wear down and intimidate the other team uh, and, and really, uh, you know, just take over the series. Uh, I think that's a big part of every playoff series is seeing that happen in hockey uh, physically and mentally. And uh, I think that's something the Bruins have to fight through. And it's going to be tougher against heavier teams like the the Panthers, uh, especially with the way that they forecheck and the fact that they've got so much skill too. Like they're a deep skilled team and they've got Bobrovsky who I think since the all-star break <laughs> has a 925 save percentage. So he's been playing brilliant. Some of his best hockey too uh, down the stretch. So you're talking about a great goalie along with everything else. And a guy that's played a lot in the playoffs and has a lot of experience there. So um, I think this is my read on the Bruins. I think they can win a first round series against a number of teams. I think they've got the talent to do it. I think they've got um, some of the parts to do it between the goaltending and, you know, the defensemen, the top end defensemen that they have. And I, like I said before, I really liked McAvoy and Lindholm playing together. If you could do that in a first round series and lock down the other team's best players and have them play in 30 minutes at night, like, why not? I think the the Bruins are good enough offensively uh, and they're good enough uh, top to bottom um, to beat a team in the first round, to beat some of these other teams that have flaws kind of like they do. Uh, Once you start getting into the Carolinas, the Floridas of the world, the New York Rangers, some of the better teams, Tampa Bay Lightning, some of the better teams in the East that you might see in the second round of the playoffs, I think that's when you're going to start to have problems. I think that's when they're going to have trouble winning. I think that's when they're going to get worn down by bigger, stronger teams, uh, deeper teams. I think that's when some of the um, weaknesses and some of the things that we've seen crop up at time to time with the Bruins are going to come home to roost. And I I think that's natural. I think that's just where they are. And at the end of the year, we uh, in the summertime, we may come to look uh, at this playoff experience and at this whole season as – Really good playoff experience for Jacob Lauco, for Johnny Beecher, Mason Lowry, if you can get him in, uh, Justin Brazeau, you know, some of the younger guys, uh, Parker Weatherspoon, um, Andrew Peak, some of the other guys, uh, even Jeremy Swayman, who frankly has not played enough playoff games because they've, you know, gone with the other guy too much. I think this could be a real good chance to really get him into the playoffs, have him start a few games in a row and see what he can do. But I think those things are what we're going to look at, I think, is the key elements of um, this playoff run is getting some of those guys some experience for next year when I think over the summer they're going to add to this team. They're going to have the cap space. They're going to have the ability to. uh, And I think next year could be uh, not only a good team based on, you know, guys coming back, the core group staying together, but being able to add significant pieces to it and really making a deeper team um, that could be, you know, like the team was a couple of years ago, sort of in that juggernaut category. Because if you add one or two quality players to what they already have, and maybe add a little more size, physicality, toughness with a, an impact player, man, you're talking about a team that's going to be difficult to beat um, and a much better team and, and a true contender in every sense of the word. So I still look at this as a transition year, this whole uh, postseason, what we're seeing right now. But with that being said, Bruins always have a chance with the goaltending they have, with some of the skill players that they have, with the talent that they have, the high end talent uh, at each position, uh, they can beat anybody. And, you know, if they can find a way to be a little more physical, I just don't think it's in their nature to be as physical as some of these other teams. And they're certainly not as heavy. But if they can find a way to combat that and, and battle that and, and become that a little bit more, embrace that. You know, maybe they'd have a better chance, but I still think one of those heavy teams is going to take them down. So I think that's a good observation. Uh, SME, great. Hags, were the bees physically dominated in the last two games in Florida? How do the bees respond in a seven game series? Kevin Chase, 18. Well, I think they got to respond like they did in the last game. They stood up to them. You know, they didn't lose their composure, they didn't take penalties. Um, the, the refs were, you know, letting a lot of it go. Uh, frankly, they were letting Florida get away with a lot. And I think they'll do that in the playoffs too. And that's just who they are. 
Um, but you have to respond to it. You have to stand up for yourself. You have to be willing to, you know, stick your nose in like Lindholm was when Bennett was really trying to take advantage of him. Uh, you have to have an attitude about it that you're not going to back down when you're a five foot nine Brad Marchand taking on a six foot four defenseman um, and, and dropping the gloves with him. Uh, I think Trent Frederick is going to be a big uh, presence and he's going to have to be. I think he's been too quiet lately and I think he's going to have to really bust out. Um in, in a playoff series, uh, I think a guy like Brazo, you add to the mix is going to help a uh, big body. He's not obviously a killer out there, but I, I think he can help, uh, especially against a bigger, stronger defenseman core um, if he can get down low. So, you know, and Morgan Geeky is another guy that I think will be built for the playoffs because he's a bigger, stronger body uh, that has good second, third effort skill. And, you know, it's kind of a throwback player in a lot of ways. So uh, it'll be interesting. I think they're a little more well-equipped to deal with some of the things against Florida this time around, especially knowing what to expect and having some success against them now uh, in the regular season this year, even though they got pushed around a little bit. But it, it's not going to turn into like this like arms race where the Bruins are bringing in all these tough guys and it's going to be this like war uh, going on the ice because they're just not built that way. Like That's not how they're going to win. Um, they're going to win by scoring goals on the power play. Uh, if Florida puts them on it, they're going to score goals by, um, you know, withstanding a lot of what Florida is doing, standing up for themselves, fighting back when it's necessary, but not, you know, getting drag, getting drug dragged down into the alley for an alley fight against the Florida Panthers. Cause I just don't think personnel wise, they have enough guys that can do that. I do think the guys that can do that and should play that way and can have a little bit more of an attitude. The guys I mentioned geeky, um, uh, Pat Maroon, when he comes back, certainly, um, Trent Frederick, uh, you know, Charlie McAvoy, Andrew peak, I think has that capability. I think they've got some guys now that can at least play that way or could be comfortable playing that way. So those guys really need to take the lead when it comes to that stuff. And, um, you know, stand up for their teammates, uh, some of the other ones that uh, aren't as comfortable doing that. Uh, but they're going to have to, you know, they're just going to have to get out of their comfort zone when it comes to those situations and stand up to it and fight back and maybe earn some penalties along the way. Um, and, and that's the only way they're going to beat a team like the Florida Panthers. So uh, it, it'll be interesting. I, I continue to think that uh, they could win in the first round, but second round against Florida might be where it ends for them. I think that's going to be a tough matchup for them. Uh, but the road, I think, to the Stanley Cup final is going to go through Fort Lauderdale. They're going to have to beat that Panthers bully, and they should have to, frankly, if they're going to advance deep into the playoffs. So, uh, you know, the games have been entertaining. That last game in Florida was fun. Uh, I was full of passion, uh, and it felt like a playoff game. So it'll be an entertaining series at the very least, so that'll be good. And I think the Florida Panthers are definitely taking on uh, some of that villain role uh, when it comes to the Bruins and their fans. So. Uh, that stuff will be all good. It'll be entertaining either way, and I think that's good news for everybody. Um, all right, that's it for this week's show. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, let's thank Prize Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Uh, testing your skills on pros prize picks this season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into a thousand with just a few taps. It's really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entries in less than 60 seconds, quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types or what prize, what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Um, so, you know, if you haven't tried it out yet, I think you really should. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I, I think it's it's a, a beautiful way to merge fantasy sports with, uh, you know, being able to turn ten dollars into a thousand dollars. Who doesn't want to do that? Um, but it's it's definitely an enjoyable. Um, and you know, it's it's a makes the Bruins games a little more interesting. You can have David David Pasternak pick shots on net. You can have Charlie McAvoy pick hits. You can pick saves for Jeremy Swayman, more or less. It's it's fantastic. Uh, it's fun and pretty simple, so download the Prize Picks app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's download the Prize Picks app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Thank you very much, Prize Picks, for sponsoring uh, Bucks with Hags, which is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. 
All right, that's it for this episode of Pucks with Hags. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you at the ring. <laughs>